Registrations are now open for the 6th Bioceuticals Research Symposium to be held in Melbourne from the 27th to the 29th of April 2018. Keynote speakers will include Professor Terry Walls, Dr Amy Myers, Professor Yehuda Schoenfeld and Dr Elisa Song. Book your ticket now by visiting bioceuticals.com.au and clicking on the Education tab. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining me on the line today is Rachel Arthur. She's contributed a decade of teaching naturopathy across SSNT, Endeavour, Monash University, Victoria University, and lastly, Southern Cross University. Rachel's family have a running joke that wherever she goes, she manages to come across her past students. They cover a wide distribution across Australia and New Zealand and encompass a range of professions, including naturopaths, doctors and allied health professionals. Whether it's circulating free weekly blogs to her professional peers about important things she's just discovered that can improve the way we practice, or being a key speaker at the major integrative medical conferences or co-founding the extraordinary Australian Naturopathic Summit, Rachel sees every platform as an opportunity to improve the knowledge base of the naturopathic and integrative professional community, as well as raise the standard of our profession by virtue of, she says hopefully, I say definitely, being a worthy ambassador. And she certainly is that, obviously. Welcome, Rachel. How are you? I'm good, thanks, Andrew. Now, Rachel, we're going to be discussing iodine. Why is iodine such an issue in Australia? I think that um, there's a number of kind of coalescing reasons about why it's such a big issue. One is simply a matter of geography, Mm. and a lot of people uh, appreciate this aspect and know that the soils, generally speaking, in Australia, particularly the east coast, particularly the southeast and the southern parts of Western Australia to some extent as well, um, are really low in iodine content and that is just simply a matter of geography you know i say to people you know we can we can make vitamins we can get you know all sorts of uh animals to make vitamins for us and bacteria minerals it comes down to the rocks Mm. and the soil and iodine is is profoundly influenced by those sort of factors so we know that this is an issue for a lot of regions in Australia, there's low iodine content. We also know one of the other really big players here was the change in sanitising practices in the dairy industry. So previously the primary source or the biggest contributor to iodine intake in Australians was found to be um, dairy products, much to people's surprise, but it was actually the major contributor um, and that was prior to a change in, as we were saying, you know, the, the use of sanitizers. They were previously iodophores, iodine-based, um, that was used in milking sheds and that sort of thing for cleaning milk vats. Um, there was a change in practice um, around this, and so they are no longer typically used, and this has radically changed the iodine content in dairy, we some of us might sort of think, oh, so what? What does that matter? But as I said, prior to this change in practice, dairy actually was the biggest contributor yeah. to iodine intake in the Australian diet, and and that change has translated to mean, you know, there have been some studies where they've actually gone back to exactly the same region in Victoria and New South Wales and sampled the milk, um, and checked the iodine content after this change in practice, and they've found drops of up to 66% wow. in the iodine content. So it's really quite potent. So I think, you know, we've got one is geography, two is this change in the dairy industry, three is the fact that we don't actually use iodine on as part of our fertilising in mass agriculture in Australia. So, ah. you know, your home garden knows to go and get some kelp yep. off the beach. Yep, yep. <laughs> but unfortunately it's not used 
um, on a large scale in any sort of commercial fertilising um, products. Um, and, yeah, to, to put those all together along with some good kind of, you know, environmental goitrogen exposure, which we all, uh, you know, unfortunately exposed to, and, and that's probably the culmination of why iodine is such an issue. In Australia. And now, of course, we've changed our practices, as you say, from iodine. So we're now having a chlorine supplement in our milk. Is that, is that what? That's right. <laughs> Lovely. It's called the double whammy. So, you know, they took out the iodine, they replaced it with chlorine. We know that chlorine blocks iodine uptake to a certain extent. Um, you know, so we're going, well, you know, we've lost something and, and now got one hand tied behind our back as well. So yeah. it's, you know, it's quite interesting to think about, you know, what seemingly was a small, you know, change in a vaguely related industry that perhaps has had quite potent ramifications on the nutrition of a whole population. Mm. It, it, yeah. I remember um, Professor Creswell Eastman talking about this issue that it sort of resurfaced because it was an issue in the what the nineteen fifties or something, nineteen forties with goitrogen with goiters, yeah. and then there was this iodized salt thing. Then salt became bad, so yeah. so it was ju- right. it's just been this flow on flow on flow on, and now it's resurfacing again. Has anybody looked at what? the mandatory fortification of iodine of all bread apart from organic has been what the effect of that has been in Australian, especially children, pregnant women, I would imagine, but also the general population? They have. We're only just starting to look at it now. I mean, this this rollout of this public health initiative of commercial bread fortification, so basically what it meant is that commercial breads now, rather than using standard salt, had to use an iodized salt instead. Um, as you said, there were a few breads that were exempt from that. That included not just organic, but also salt-free breads and bread mixes. So people making their own bread at home didn't, you know, have yep. to have um, iodized salt in there. Um, so the whole kind of premise behind this was: here we go, we're going to fix this iodine deficit that Australians suffer from, and we're going to fix it by putting it into bread that everybody eats you know, in inverted commas. The modelling for this, so of course there was extensive kind of scientific modelling behind the public health initiative Mm. and mathematical modelling was based on the idea that every individual would consume roughly three slices of this bread per day and that that would contribute about 54 micrograms of iodine, you know, to to people's daily intake. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that you heard me say at a conference, Andrew, and I often say this, yes. is to say, hands up who eats three slices of commercial, non-organic, you know, blah, 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 bread per day. And usually there's no one that puts up their hand at those conferences or maybe one or two random people. Yes. Now, that's a skewed sample, but we do know that the follow-up studies about the impact, about the degree to which this has actually addressed and resolved iodine deficiency in the community is not looking that good. The data from that is not really looking that convincing. So, you know, there's been, you know, a number of studies in particular by Charlton that was published in 2016 and also a study by Condo et al. that was published the same year. They've looked at different kind of groups. Um, We know that there's been a shift in the right direction. So we know that, um, for example, individuals that do eat these particular fortified bread mm. products at 100 grams per day, they absolutely were showing, you know, um, five times the rate of achieving adequate iodine as measured by the urinary iodine con- uh, concentration. Mm. Um, this was shown in, in women and, and I think it's 12 times the rate of iodine adequacy for for those kids that were eating 100 grams of of commercial bread every day. But we know that studies generally, when we look at the shift in um, median UIC values, they're moving in the right direction. There has been a general positive shift, but we know that the proportion of individuals that remain deficient in iodine post-fortification is still strikingly high. And in particular, Condo's study in 2016 said that or showed that 
you know, post-bread fortification, there was still over 50% of pregnant women that were iodine deficient. So we're still, you know, left going, mm, how effective has that public health initiative been? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I think also one of the problems, and Kondo talks about this, those researchers talk about this in the study, was they've actually interviewed pregnant women and said, you know, what do you know about iodine and what are you doing about iodine? And certainly one of the comments they came across um, fairly commonly was women saying, I don't need to take iodine because it's in my bread. Right. And so there's this kind of, you know, um, backflip or, or, you know, counterintuitive thing that's going on where rather than, um, necessarily giving us the results that we wanted in terms of reducing iodine deficiency, we've almost got, you know, a reverse psychology going on yeah. where at particular at-risk groups are going, I don't need to do anything about iodine anymore because apparently the government's got it sorted. Despite there being a public health recommendation from the NHMRC that pregnant and breastfeeding women have a supplement of 150 mm. micrograms even though there's bread fortification. So in other words, the bread yeah. fortification is not enough. And even though there's That's a right. MHNRC guideline for this, I remember Creswell Eakin, Eastman screaming to GPs because the message was not getting enough, um, through. This is the first time that the National Med um, Medical Health and Research Council has recommended a supplement. It wasn't folate. Folate, they said, get it from your green leafy vegetables and if you need to, take a supplement. But this is, you need a supplement even though we've fortified the bread. Yeah, look, it's really interesting, isn't it? it it's, it's kind of, we know that this is always the risk with, um, let's call it public health nutrition prescribing. We know that, um, and this is always, you know, one of the primary concerns that's raised in the proposal phase of public health nutrition, you know, um, fortification programs, is the, the concern that's raised is some people will still be deficient and not be getting enough, yep. and yet they've been reassured at some level that, you know, the government's got this covered. And then there will be some people who are overdosing. Right. And the data that's coming out is showing exactly that. So you've got the study by Condo which found that, even women, you know, this is they were looking at a pregnant cohort, even women who were taking at least the recommended 150 micrograms of iodine as a supplement per day during their pregnancy, right. even out of that group, it was 27% who were still iodine deficient, Wow! according to their measure. And then you've got the new data coming out as well, looking at... Um, you know, there's some evidence that particularly in WA and in Queensland, and as I said, because of geography, yep. there are differences in iodine intake across Australia just because of geography. So in WA and in Queensland, there is some suggestion that there is a little bit of overdosing going on just because of the introduction of bread fortification, particularly in children. So, you know, you go, yeah, it's this kind of crude, you know, it, it comes from a good place where we're trying to resolve this really um, marked issue for Australians, mm. but anything that follows that kind of one-size-fits-all yeah. model is pretty crude and you're going to see people who fall short and people who get overdosed. Yeah, but can I ask though, what was their determination of overdose? Were they talking about um, levels of iodine or were they talking about effects of iodine on, for instance, thyroid stimulating hormone? So in these particular studies, as I said, it's early days, you know, right. these, these are just coming out in the last few years and these studies have just been measuring uh, urinary iodine concentration. Right. And they're looking at median values. Um, so they're not looking at individuals and saying, little Johnny's got a problem here. They're looking at a trend in age groups and at-risk groups and things like that. Yeah. And I know that, um, you know, the trend has been across, you know, the ages in WA and Northern Territory that the median UIC has actually um, jumped up to, I think it's 
it's over 150 micrograms now. Um, and I think it's quite a bit over 150 micrograms. But they talk specifically um, in uh, in this study about, um, you know, kids and, and the really dramatic shift um, upwards in the median URC for children. So, you know, we, we're not as yet able to say and look at the impact of this mm, in terms mm. of thyroid behaviour or anything like that. But we know from other countries that there's a risk there. Okay, so they have seen a suppression of TSH in other countries that have had supplements? Um, it's not that they've seen a suppression of TSH. Probably the biggest trend that has been demonstrated in countries like Greece and Turkey, which all had very similar sort of um, problems with iodine deficiency and then mm. they introduced fortification pro- programs not dissimilar to what we've done here, um, is they found that there was... Um, you know, increases in rates of new diagnoses for autoimmune thyroid disease, right. a dramatic increase in incidence. Um, and if you look at, I mean, there's been so many studies, Andrew, I'm just sort of cherry picking, but, but they have been some of the most current ones. Mm. Um, there, of course, there's been a lot of studies looking at China because regions of China have been fortified with iodine for a long, long time they see higher incidences of a range of thyroid disease. It could be hypo, hyper, or um, we also see a very particular type of thyroid cancer that has gone up Uh in um, some of those Chinese populations as well. So the, the impact of the overdose is actually not quite individualistic, but there is huge variability in how that that excess will manifest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If there's been a, a rise in the um, urinary iodine concentration in mm. children, but if there's no effect on dampening, um, on suppression of um, thyroid stimulating hormone, then maybe it's our levels that we need to adjust, not the iodine. I, I think that that's a that that the data would. Because we have a lot of data on iodine, mm. you know. We, this has been such a well-researched mineral. It's not to say that there aren't gaps in our knowledge. But as you say, I mean, there have been countries subject to um, endemic goiter since the turn of the, you know, the, the 19th century. Yeah. I mean, we've been. this has been a, a public conversation, not just in Australia, but many countries all over the world for the last 100 plus years. And hence, we have a lot of data on you know, what deficiency looks like in terms of UIC values, what toxicity looks like in terms of UIC values. So I don't know right. that okay. that that I would support that argument. Yep. I think that there is quite strong evidence that a, UI, that a UIC value for an individual or for a population as an adult, you know, over 300 micrograms per litre, is going to start to suggest uh, that that people are getting so much that it's going to be problematic for them. Yeah, that there's big bodies of data that suggests that. And in women, in pregnant women, you know the the um, maximum level you want to see in the UIC is 500. Mm. And it, it's not based on you know small data sets. This is based on huge studies from all over the world. I want to ask about toxicity, but before that, I want to try and clear up something in my mind that I just thought of. And that is, I used to say, I, you know, say Australia has an iodine deficiency issue because it's an old continent and all of the minerals are washed away. But Mm. then there's an issue in Nepal, which is a new continent Mm. and it's a mountainous area. It doesn't gel. Yeah. The, well, again, it's it's fascinating, isn't it? Because when we talk about the geography and we say, oh, you know, it's about the soils and the ro- soil and the rocks, even that is is oversimplifying. Yeah. It. It's about the rate of precipitation or the water exposure of the soil. That's one of the other major determinants of gotcha. iodine because iodine is highly leachable. So if you've got an area that is um, subject to you know high rainfall, whether it's monsoonal or you know, just because you're lucky enough to live in Tasmania or whatever yeah. it is, mm. then that, regardless of how your, you know, the iodine content in the rocks and the soil to begin with, that places that region at risk mm. because it is such a leachable mineral. So, you know, there are all these other kind of, um, 
I guess, um, factors in the environment. We, you know, we talk about the kind of the environmental iodine cycle. Um, so yes, there's what was existing in there in the soil and the rocks in the first place. And I've read some fascinating stuff, Andrew, that says, um, you know, coastal areas are at risk, but so are inland. Um, you know, <laughs> young mountainous areas are at risk, but so are, you know, flat area, right. you know, like, you, so you realize that, um, it is more complex There's no than just saying rule. this is an old continent or this is a new continent yeah. or this is mountainous or, yeah. But mm. certainly water, the, the exposure of that landscape to heavy irrigation practices or heavy rainfall is one of the most detrimental things in terms of the iodine content that uh, remains in that soil for the plants and for the water source for us to consume. So about toxicity, you know, I, I, like I remember an old argument, and you and I have discussed this a bit, but um, a, a debate that went on between somebody that used to propose extremely high dosages of iodine versus somebody that was a lot more salient in their dosages, Guy Abrahams versus Dr. Alan Gabrick. Um, what's the appropriate iodine dose and just how toxic are we talking with this halide? Look, I think that, like I, like I just sort of suggested before, I, I'm not um, ever going to say we know everything about iodine. We really don't. It, it, you know, I, I think that... Um, our knowledge will continue to build in this area. I think that if we're talking, you know, and that may change, you know, some of our thoughts over time, but I think if we're talking about, you know, that huge contrast in school of thought between Alan Gabby and, you know, Guy Abraham, you know, one's talking about, you know, too much iodine is never enough, you know, um, you know, we need milligram doses, all of us do, you know, every day mm. to be well. And Alan Gabby, of course, um, you know, encouraged us to be cautious and to question the level of evidence that that mega dose was sort of based on. Um, I certainly sit on the side of Alan Gabby and think that um, mega dosing um, is problematic. I think that, again, you know, I can come at this from so many different angles. Either I can, you know, talk about the plethora of studies that have been done. I mentioned some of them before on, uh, you know, populations, post-fortification programs and some of the uh, negative health consequences of excesses. And then people will say, yeah, but that's because they used, you know, <laughs> iodide and they didn't use iodine. Yeah, yeah. And equally, I can talk to you about case studies where iodine has been used yep. and either that has been um, iodine orally or iodine topically. If you talk to any doctor who's worked in a hospital, mm. they'll tell you that iodine toxicity They've all experienced it because of individuals who were painted with betadine post-burns or post-surgery, and then they watched their thyroid go berserk. Mm. That was one of the unfortunate consequences of, of uh, you know, trying to trying to uh, you know provide antiseptic on the skin to these individuals. So you know, and and I have seen so many cases of people taking excessive doses, milligram doses of iodine that unfortunately have gone horribly wrong. So I think that, you know, there, there, is, um, there is reason to be very cautious. Um, and, you know, my, my position is certainly that micrograms are what are needed for the majority of individuals milligrams are needed in a very small number of patients with, you know, extenuating circumstances. Yeah, yeah. But I'm very nervous about the kind of message out there from advocates of medical dosing who sort of suggest that, you know, there's no harm that can come from this. Uh, yeah, I, I think I have to agree with you there. I, I must tell you about a, an example, and it was a mistake. It was a, a mistake in dosage that I made. Um, yeah. where the dosage that I wanted to give was drops, four drops, because of a communication mm. issue, four mils 
was given. Mm. Now, four mils is what we used to give pre-surgery for somebody with thyrotoxicosis to aid in mm. shutting down their thyroid before thyroid ablation surgery. And yet in this particular lady, now I must describe this patient because I think this speaks volumes about the, um, the reason that there wasn't an issue. This lady was a large lady. She was tall. Mm. She was, let's say, big boned. She wasn't obese. She was a big lady and she had fibrocystic breast disease. And we went through all of the issues, being assessed, not this, not no, been palpated by a doctor. She'd had mammographies done. She'd had all of the safety issues done where I was concerned about some covering up some issue or even feeding some uh, tumour type condition. And what I gave her or what, what I wanted to give her was four drops of Lou Gold solution, uh, two drops twice daily. But because, as I said, of a communication misinterpretation for mills were given, uh, thankfully, this lady had absolutely no untoward side effects. And indeed, her fibrocystic breast disease resolved totally for a period of months, even upon the short-term dosage. However, I am supremely embarrassed about that communication error. And I would never, ever recommend it to anybody, yeah. particularly yeah. in light of, you know, conditions being flipped like Hashimoto's, where you can cause all sorts of issues giving high doses. Mm. But what's yeah, been your experience? Um, my experience has been in terms of uh, seeing iodine excess at plays. I you know, there's been that ongoing debate about the wolf Tchaikov effect and is it real? Does it apply to humans? Um, was the original, you know, study misinterpreted? Yeah. That's yeah. certainly an argument that's been put forward. Um, I am, you know, confident that without a doubt I've seen the wolf Tchaikov effect in humans. Right. Um, you know, I've actually seen their, um, their TSH uh you know, go up. Yep. We expect that to be the case regardless of, you know, the rest of the story when people start taking iodine. But I've actually seen people's T4 levels drop from in range to completely below range. I've seen their T3 drop below range as well in response to excessive doses of iodine. So, you know, I, and, you know, the argument again put forward is, you know, um, that after a period of adjustment, these people will escape the wolf Tchaikov effects, that the thyroid will, you know, kind of recalibrate yes, the higher circulating levels of iodine and will start to normalise. And, um, you know, I've seen patients where there's no way that that was ever happening. And, in fact, what was they were getting themselves in more and more trouble with more apparent hypothyroidism you know, symptoms, their levels continued to, their thyroid levels continued to get lower. And one of the big things that I think, you know, isn't talked about enough is iodine is quite antigenic. It actually attracts the attention of the immune system. It's iodine, not anywhere in the body, but as part of that thyroglobulin molecule, which of course is in the follicular cells of the, um, the follicle cells of the thyroid. Yep. So if, you know, one of the classic things I've seen, and this has been in many, many cases, is somebody who's overtreated with iodine, they either didn't have thyroglobulin antibodies present at baseline, but they sure as heck do now, or they did have levels, but these have jumped dramatically thanks again to iodine. Right. So as much as Iodine so important for the thyroid, it does have a double edge or a, a dual sort of personality. You know, a deficiency is bad for it, but an excess, I truly believe, is bad for it as well. Yeah. So um, firstly, can I just ask you to explain to our listeners what the wolf Tchaikov effect is? So the wolf Tchaikov effect was originally came about from a couple of researchers called Wolf and Tchaikov, wouldn't you know it? Yes. Um, and uh, they, um, they did some animal studies. I think it was rat-based. And they were looking at um, intraperitoneal injections of high dose iodine and how the gland responded to that. Um, there has been a lot of criticism of this study um, and a lot of different interpretations of it. What they did uh, talk about as a consequence of that high exposure to iodine was some, you know, uh, 
you know, reduction in thyroid hormone levels. Mm. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work on this since Wolf Tchaikov. <laughs> I think that's the problem. You know, we all go, oh, that study on the rats in the 19, you know, yeah. whatever, that leaves a lot to be desired. And I'm like, well, keep reading, people, because we've done a lot since then. We know that, um, you know, when you do overexpose the thyroid to um, excessive iodine, that we see a shutdown of sodium iodide symporters. They're the gateways or the doorways on the surface of the gland that are responsible for picking up iodine and, and hyperconcentrating it within the gland. So the way that I always describe the wolf Tchaikov effect to people is that, you know, it, it's almost like the gland in response to detection of supra-physiological you know, concentrations of iodine literally shuts up shop and says, you know what, if I kept, kept picking up the 80%, you know, of passing iodine, like the gland normally does, if I kept picking up such large proportion of this, you know, now mega dose of iodine, mm. I am going to place my human at risk of thyrotoxicosis. And so as a compensatory mechanism, it closes up those doorways. It down-regulates the sodium iodide symporters and you see that it you know, stops concentrating or picking up the iodine. As a result of that, we see the whole conveyor belt of thyroid hormone production slow right down and that corresponds with the dropping T4 and T3 that we see in patients results who are affected by this. So that's the wolf Tchaikov effect in a nutshell. This happens within 24 hours. And this was the original study suggested that this could, this kind of um, thyroid response to megadosing can start to occur within 24 hours of a megadose. Um, you know, and then there's the possibility, you know, that um, that individuals can, you know, adjust to this. This is called the escape to the wolf Tchaikov effect, that that may take some days. Mm. But I would say, you know, I've seen too many cases where practitioners or patients have been encouraged to just keep riding this, you know, so-called temporary aggravation from high iodine, so low T4 and low T3 levels, massively elevated TSH. And, you know, they, they've been doing it for weeks. And I say, well, that that's not, you know, that the wolf Tchaikov effect. If you're going to escape it, um, you know, then if your thyroid is capable of doing that, then it will do that within a matter of days yeah. or within the week. You shouldn't have stayed on that long term. It's not doing, you know, the, the, the answer is you're not going to escape it. Yeah. Given, though, that, you know, the production of the thyroid hormones, the thyroglobulin, et cetera, that there's so many other nutrients involved in that production, could there be an uh, an issue with something else furthering the prolonged wolf Tchaikov effect? Could there be another reason, like a comorbid issue? Yeah, look, I, I think that it is possible. And, you know, there's always this kind of speculation. Like I said at the beginning, you know, iodine overdosage takes various forms in a range of individuals, mm. anything from hyper to hypo to malignancy to, you know, nothing. Mm. They did great on iodine. And I think that there's a lot of unknowns in there, you know. I think that, um, you know, could could there be nutritional cofactors? Sure, but the sort of situations where I've seen um, – exactly this, the wolf Tchaikov effect and the inability to escape it from megadoses of iodine, these patients had every other nutrient, you know, um, ticked off the list. They right. were absolutely, you know, buoyant in their selenium and, you know, everything else. So so we couldn't see why um, there would be particular vulnerability for them. So I think there are a lot of unknowns, mm -hmm. and I think that's the risk. I think when, you know, you get um, someone using a protocol that says, you know, 50 milligrams for everyone or 12 milligrams for everyone, it just really, it just doesn't work, mm. you know. Um, it just doesn't work because there is too many individual kind of biochemical or physiological factors in there. So should we be supporting the patient rather than the thyroid? 
including, you know, looking at, for instance, particularly with Hashimoto's, looking at their levels of stress, their possible um, exposure to toxins and all that sort of thing? I, I mean, I, I think so. I think, I think um, you know, with this, you know, incredible rise in autoimmune thyroid disease, um, mm. particularly Hashimoto's in Australia, um, you know, it, it's not uh, it's not going to come down just to iodine. You know, iodine may be no. a pivotal player in some patients' cases, but like everything else, we need to take uh, a broad perspective. Um, and I think that, you know, a, a lot of practitioners are very good at that, at thinking about, you know, what else is playing into that this pathology. I think, you know, iodine is, as I said, part of the solution for some people, um, but I haven't seen iodine on its own fix anything. Rarely, no. rarely works unless, of course, it's a bullet. Um, yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. what about, um, you know, dosage issues then, given that we've already uncovered a conundrum and that is that we should be supporting the patient rather than the thyroid. Can you help our listeners out with general or broad sort of um, safe guidelines with dosage or even variances in dosage with different conditions, particularly, I guess, with how high would you go with Hashimoto's? Where do you go well back there? Yeah. Well, I think what I'll start with is probably my, um, you know, my kind of exclusion criteria. Yeah, Who cool. I don't, you know, the people that I would um, have to uh, think long and hard about ever justifying giving them iodine. Because um, there is quite a list of people that I think... Um, iodine can be contraindicated in. Um, so I'm going to start there because, yes. you know, that, that, you know, sort of sets the scene. So, you know, iodine should not be used in Gray's disease unless it is being prescribed by basically an endocrinologist or a specialist. The whole idea, um, many people will know that it actually can be a very effective strategy to getting graves under control. And the mechanism for that is it induces the wolf trichoff effect, exactly what we were saying before. It shuts the thyroid down and it shuts it down faster than anti-thyroid meds because, as we said, it can happen, start to take effect within 24 hours. So, but that particular protocol or that prescription of using high dose iodine to literally shut down a thyroid gland in Graves' disease, that is something that, you know, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to be, that I wouldn't want that to happen on my watch, on my shift. No. That needs to be something that is prescribed and monitored by an endocrinologist who really is familiar with that. It's good to know it's an option. In fact, there was a paper just, I think it was this year, that um, has um, concluded that that strategy is the safest strategy for dealing with graves in pregnancy, which is really oh. kind of interesting yeah. to, to finally hear that um, con conclusion come out. But as I said, it's, it's not within the scope of our practice. It's pretty dangerous um, and there's a lot of risks associated with it. So graves for me, I go, it's a no-go zone. Don't use iodine because these people are primed, of course, to turn every drop of iodine into more thyroid hormone and they already have an excess. The Hashimoto's debate, whether you use it or you don't, I actually sit on the side of not using it in most cases. The reason is in Hashimoto's, there's a couple of reasons. One is that you have often an active thyroiditis at play and... Um, you know, iodine can make that worse. Um, particularly, as I said, when these patients have a significant level of thyroglobulin antibodies. Now, thyroglobulin antibodies, normally people don't pay so much attention to these because they're not considered as clinically kind of correlatable with the disorder. They're more interested in those TPO antibody levels. Mm -hmm. But it's the thyroglobulin antibodies that really can be made a lot worse by iodine. So when I see a Hashimoto's patient, if they've got some of these already bubbling around, it really cools my heels about 
addressing any sort of iodine deficiency that I think is present. I have to really kind of weigh up the pros and cons. So do you then sway your your support for that patient more towards an anti-inflammatory type treatment aspect, if you like? I think, I think that in active thyroiditis, whether it's Hashimoto's, um, Graves, uh, Dequervins, which is an unusual type of thyroiditis, mm. postpartum, the first thing that often we should be thinking about is protection. You know, how do we protect that gland? Um, and the best way to protect that, you know, the thyroid gland is really through the use of selenium, uh, you know, NAC. These things have been tried and true. We know that selenium, through its role in the glutathione peroxidases, is effectively the fire extinguisher for the thyroid gland. We know that it has the capacity to lower antibody titers, and that is indicative of it really ramping or or reigning in the immune system there. So we know that, you know, selenium and NAC are both very hands on in their role of controlling that active damage and inflammation going on in the gland, and I think that that's really important. Mm. And then we can kind of, you know, start to talk about vitamin D adequacy and, you know, as immunomodulatory and and those sort of things around that as well. But, yes, when there's active thyroiditis, iodine really usually isn't the first thought at all. It's more about those protective nutrients and antioxidant control there. Yeah. So I I got you off topic there. Sorry. So other conditions where you're reticent to... Other conditions. Yeah. Other conditions are anybody who has multi-nodular goiter. Mm. So multi-nodular goiter is quite common. Um, The the risk is that that a multi-nodular goiter becomes what's called a toxic uh, nodular goiter. That just means the difference is that those um, nodules that are present on the thyroid start to autonomously pick up iodine and autonomously make thyroid hormone. So, of course, the um, you know unchecked risk or potential risk here is that you're going to end up with a thyrotoxicosis because of you know those nodules being overfed with iodine and. You know, one of the interesting ones is, you know, if you go to a lot of, say, pharmacy textbooks or you ask, you know, a group of endocrinologists um, whether anyone on thyroxin should be taking iodine, the kind of consensus statement is no, they shouldn't. Now, I can see a lot of situations where there would be benefit from taking additional iodine for some people that are on thyroid replacement therapy. But again, I think we have to acknowledge that there is a degree of risk Mm. and that that patient has to be, you know, really well monitored to make sure that there's safety and efficacy in terms of giving them any iodine in addition to thyroxin. Yeah. Like I know what I'm thinking and I'm I'm thinking I don't want to see the inside of a courtroom. Um, (laughs) So, but I guess the question's got to be asked, how brave do you get? If, say, you did a 24-hour urinary uh, iodine sample and it did come up as them being on a certain dose of thyroxine, which contains iodine, it is the T4, and still having an iodine deficiency, how brave would you be about supplementing even judiciously? I do supplement um, in a situation like you described where I have a good level of evidence for an ongoing deficiency. So yes, thyroxine contains iodine. It's actually a very low level of iodine. Um, I have quantified it, but I can't think of the numbers off the top of my head, but it's pretty low. You'd mm. be surprised. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if, given that the standard dose of thyroxine is about 100 micrograms. Um, so, you know, the, the idea that somebody who's on thyroid replacement therapy doesn't need any more iodine, that all their mm. iodine needs to met is kind of pretty bizarre because, of course, we know that the thyroid, the thyroid is but one gland that has an iodine, uh, you know, requirement. We know that the gastric mucosa and um, the breast tissue equally express sodium iodide symporters at a comparable level with the thyroid gland, like they have a major iodine requirement, these two other tissues. And then there's a whole list of other tissues 
that have sodium iodine importers and the capacity to pick up iodine, but not quite, you know, up at that same sort of um, enormous level. That's things like salivary glands, thymus, the epidermis, you know, they all need iodine as well. So I think that that sort of, you know, that um, idea that they're on thyroxine, no, no more is required is, is very flawed. It doesn't match with the science. But I understand from a litigious point of view that we do need to be very careful when we co-supplement that we are not, um, you know, um, upsetting the thyroid management or, you know, um, co- you know, contravening the, the therapy, the other therapy that's being used. Are there any situations where you'd go, look, I've done this test. As you say, there is a good level of evidence to show that there's an ongoing iodine deficiency, but I'm not touching it. You can have it. Yes, I absolutely have. I've got a few patients like that. Yeah. I've got a few, and it's and, and it's really come about from having my fingers burnt just a couple of times. Yeah. So a couple of times, you know, I went, right, you know, level of evidence, but, you know, they definitely have iodine deficiency. What am I going to do? And I thought, look, I'll go very cautiously because that certainly is the way I approach all of these situations. So I have one case uh, actually, you know, um, that's quite fresh in my mind where this patient um, had thyroglobulin antibodies. I had a good level of evidence that they still had an iodine, that they concurrently had an iodine deficiency. I put it off said, no, no, you know, they've got thyroglobin antibodies. It looks a bit uh, a bit risky. I won't, I won't give them iodine. Put it off, put it off, and then eventually said, look, I'll just include 100 micrograms a day in the prescription. And at 100 micrograms per day, we watched those <laughs> thyroglobin antibodies go through the roof right, from gosh. where they were. So, you know, I think that there are situations where I say, and this is kind of like a... You know, this is this is not something. This is not a position that I can say is supported by the research. This is a little Rachel Arthur kind of position after twenty years of practice, where I would say that for some people, perhaps the problem with their thyroid, to some extent, was caused by an iodine deficiency. Perhaps they present to you and they still have one. The the problem is when you're faced with a real conundrum like this is in some of those patients, I have to say, even though I can see there is still some iodine deficiency going on, the the pros and cons just don't weigh up and I feel that the damage has already been done to your gland. Now, that doesn't sound very uplifting, but what I'm saying is when patients really do have marked thyroglobulin antibodies, mm. it's a bit of a wrong way go back sign yeah. for iodine. Yeah. If you have to come about it from a different angle. Yes. You have to resolve those antibody levels from a different angle before you can bring in any iodine. That's that's my personal experience after years of dealing with this. Um and, and yeah, so there will be people who I'll say just make sure you eat iodine in your <laughs> diet, but we're not going to do any more than that. Yeah, you know, at this point, they're yeah. on the side of caution. So I guess this yeah. leads into, if you know, you, as we've said before in that last example, you know, sure that there was a an iodine deficiency going on, but what do you do? How should we being be assessing iodine status? Um, highly contentious issue, of course, and I love nothing more than a good bit of contentious. That's why I'm asking um, you. <laughs> that's right. Look, um, there are so many, um, you know, ideas put forward about how to assess the iodine level of an individual. Um, you know, some of them are things like the PATS test where you paint somebody's skin with betadine and you see, you know, how quickly that colour disappears. Um, that's completely a furphy. It, it doesn't actually reflect the iodine status of the individual. What it actually reflects is like the um, rate of evaporation off your skin, which comes down to things like the temperature and the moisture of the air and things like that. So actually when we paint our skin with betadine or something like that, about 88% of the iodine will evaporate. It's just a question of how quickly it does that and 
that has nothing to do with your iodine yeah. requirements or your iodine status. And the other reason why the colour disappears is we also have iodine being reduced back to iodide. So iodine has a colour, iodine, iodide doesn't. So, you know, that's again got nothing to do with your, you know, iodine kind of uh, nutriture. Yeah. So the PAX test is out. Sorry to break the news, but it is. It's out. It's it, it's not um, got any. Don't be apologising to me. I'm glad you covered it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, you know, then if you go to, you know, as I say, I mean, iodine is is you know so extensively researched all over the world. You'd think we'd have an answer, wouldn't you, Andrew? You'd think we'd know by now how to determine the iodine status of an individual, and yet, out of all these studies which say we know how to quantify the iodine intake of a population and the iodine status of a population, just about every research paper will tell you that these tests and these assessments are only accurate in populations and we can't use them on the one individual sitting in front of you, that they lose their accuracy and validity once we try and do an N equals one sort of sample. Yeah. So what I'm referring to here, of course, is urinary iodine assessment. It is absolutely the gold standard in terms of knowing whether Bangladeshis need you know, more iodine or Australians need more iodine. But if I'm looking at one Australian... The researchers and the you know powers that be would say, sorry, we don't have a test <laughs> that that can tell you that. And you go, really? Um, so, so is it is it more appropriate to test for deficiency rather than adequacy? No, they would still say the test alone. There, the, the, the test is not a reliable marker wow. of status. Wow. Full stop in an individual. Wow. So they would say there are too many mitigating factors. Yeah. Um, they are, because, of course, the amount of iodine in the urine is really reflective of the intake of iodine over the last 24 to 48 hours. So if you had a big nori fest yesterday, then your iodine is going to look fab today. And if you didn't, if you had a big kale juice, you know, extravaganza, it's going to look like a shocker <laughs> <You>. today. <laughs> So that's right. So, you know, that's their argument is it's it's unreliable even in the one individual. I you know, you you've heard me say, Andrew, you know, getting iodine adequacy in a patient or trying to achieve iodine adequacy, which I think is a good goal, right? I think it's an important goal, particularly in a country a country like Australia. Yep. I think it's hard enough without being told, now you have to do it blindfolded because we don't have a test. Yes. <laughs> I go, really? <laughs> so I still use urinary, what's called a random urinary iodine concentration. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I have a few caveats around it to try and control for those sort of uh, limitations. So of the test itself. So one of the things I say is, you know, don't have a nori fest or a kale juice extravaganza the day before. I want you to eat a representative diet. Like what do you normally eat? Stick with that. Don't vary from that um, in the three days leading up to the test. The second thing is the test has to be taken fasting. So let's make sure that it is your, uh, sorry, not just fasting, it needs to be the first morning urination. So let's make sure that, you know, you go in and you weigh in the jar at the collection centre first thing in the morning because there is actually diurnal variation mm. in urinary iodine levels, okay? So, you know, I start to put these kind of protocols in place to increase the reliability and the accuracy of the result we get. The third thing, which is something that, I, you know, I, um, I debate feverishly with people is I think that you have to take into account the concentration of the urine. So if you have a patient who has very, very dilute urine, that can trick you into thinking that the iodine is very low because, of course, it's just a random sample. It's just a kind of they're only taking a tiny amount. But if that urine is very dilute, 
the iodine will also look very, very dilute. And so, you know, you can be tricked into the wrong kind of interpretation with mm. both excessively dilute and excessively concentrated samples. So all that necessitates is when they do their uh, urinary iodine test first thing in the morning, that the pathology company also measures creatinine in that sample because creatinine is really the, the gold standard in, uh, you know, um, kind of benchmarking the concentration of a urine sample. And then there's just a little formula that you use so that you can account for that concentration or that hydration sort of effect. So I do still use that. I say that I never use a urinary iodine concentration alone in a patient to conclude anything about their iodine status. It has to be married with the, you know, other what I call secondary markers of iodine nutriture. So that's things like, you know, have a look at their TSH, have a look at their T4 levels and start to see if there is congruency, if there's, you know, a, a, a shared sort of picture emerging. So what we're looking for here is, in particular, I think the most important secondary marker is the T4 level. If we see a T4 level that is dropping below 12, that really is kind of my line in the sand where I start to question, yeah. not conclude, but just question iodine deficiency. If I have a T4 dropping below 12 and a UIC value that looks low, then I'm starting to say, okay, you know, th th we're starting to get, you know, more than one piece of evidence pointing towards this kind of conclusion. There's two things I have to say here. The first thing is, it's obvious to me that iodine is such an issue. It, um, and this in particular, it's so controversial, even though we think we might have it right with a simple health guideline, we haven't got it right. Um, that <clears> people people need to be joining your mentorship group to be able to discuss this at depth. I do get a bit excited about iodine, it's true. But it's, but it's from a place of responsibility, and this is what I really like about mm. you. You care, you give a damn about mm. your patients. Mm. That's the first thing I'll tell our listeners before we go any further. I did want to ask one quick other question, though. We know that, you know, measuring T4 doesn't tell us how well that thyroid hormone is working. Do yep. you use random urinary iodine concentrations with creatinine, mm -hmm. but also combining it with other assessments, relevant assessments of metabolic rate? Yeah, good question. So first of all, you're right, T4 is the inactive form and, and you know, it, it's only one sort of piece of the thyroid, you know, efficacy or, or, or health picture. The classic thing that I would say, though, why I look to T4 is because iodine, the way to think about its relationship to T4 is it's like the rate-limiting ingredient. Mm. So what I'm saying is if you haven't got the iodine, you will not make the T4. No. It is simply it's, – it's a chocolate cake without any chocolate. Yeah, that's right. You just go, can't do, mm. can't do. So if you've got someone who's got um, – uh, you know, uh, you're questioning iodine deficiency and they've got a T4 of 15, forget it, okay? This person has iodine. This person has got plenty of iodine. They wouldn't be making that level of T4 if, in fact, it was really a big deficit. So the T3 thing, the interesting thing in iodine deficiency, the classic picture is that the T4 drops because the gland, you know, it's missing the chocolate for the chocolate cake but can't make as much. But in compensation for that, the T3 levels relative to the T4 actually rise. So it's a trick. You know, people might, uh, if they don't know that, they might go looking for low T4, low T3. That's not necessarily the classic picture of iodine deficiency. The other question you asked me is, should we be looking at other markers like basal metabolic rate and temperature and things like that? I think that we can and sometimes we should. In fact, I believe that the most, I'm probably going to give it the wrong sort of um, uh, description, but certainly a well-validated uh, assessment for thyroid is the speed of the Achilles reflex. I'm pretty sure that's still regarded um, as being one of the, the most important markers. Hmm. So, you know, there are certainly people who practice in that way and use um, 
you know, testing that measures reflex speeds and things like that. So I think that there is an interesting aspect. Um, in terms of basal body temperature, it's very, very hard to get accurate readings. And if you talk to a lot of clinicians who've had extensive experience in this area, they will agree and say, yeah, <laughs> you know, I get a lot of results. So I'm not sure about their validity. I'm not sure about you know, how well that temperature has been taken in the patient. So I think that uh, it's a little bit tricky, the yep. application of that. But I think definitely, you know, the more we can take our blinkers off and, and kind of look around the whole case and say, where is the evidence, you know, for iodine deficiency and how many pieces of evidence can I, can I um, attribute in this case, I, I think the better the job you're doing and the more likely you are to succeed with, you know, you, your treatment and your intervention. Rachel, Arthur, I, I truly do admire two things, not just two, but two main things about you. One is that you care. You truly care for your patients. And it's evident after years and years of practice, no offence meant. But the, yeah. the other thing is that you constantly question. And you are never, yeah. ever satisfied with the status quo. You will always question and question again what you think. Am I, is this the current truth? Is this what's true now? Mm. And I, I truly, mm. truly admire you for that because the people that are under your mentorship now are truly learning to be better clinicians, safe clinicians. So, and I really admire you for that. So thank you for taking us through Thanks, the, the quandary that still exists with regards to iodine today on FX Medicine. That's right. Look, I, I think that, you know, a lot of us, I've said this before, who are in this business are, are mavericks by nature and we're naturally good at questioning things. And I think that a lot of nutrition still, there's a lot of gaps in our knowledge. So we have to keep asking ourselves, you know, what do we understand now? How does it change our opinion now? What have we learnt from our mistakes? Mm. You know, how can that change the way we go forward? And I think iodine is a great example of that. This is FX Medicine, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. If you're loving our FX Medicine podcasts, please don't forget to share us with your colleagues, family and friends.